CJ Schweitzer. I am Jeremy Lance. We are finally uh, shaking off the food coma from Thanksgiving and uh, deciding to put on a podcast. Yeah, it only took us about a week. I think I woke ah. up sometime yesterday for the first time after Thanksgiving. Yeah, I was, I was, I was struggling. What, what did you guys end up doing? We, we did a duck. We had duck. I made a duck for Christmas or for uh, Thanksgiving. Yeah, I, I saw that. It, it looked really well cooked and not in like an overdone sense, but it looked like it was a delicious duck. I mean, I spent most of Wednesday. So what, what happened was is we, we did kind of have some like plans to like meet up with like a few family members and kind of have a small family gathering. Um, but then that like many family gatherings that were even trying to get off the ground, I uh, crashed and burned when someone was like, Hey, I just found out I was like exposed to somebody who tested positive. So that like died like Tuesday night. I think like I literally got the text as we were getting ready to record last week. And so Wednesday, we basically had to spend the whole time going like, so what are we going to do? Like, are we going to make like, right. what can we do? Like, what yeah. what can we do? Because it's like, it's Wednesday. So are we going to do a, t- a turkey for six people seems excessive. The, you know, it's hard to find a real small turkey. Um, and then like, if we find a small turkey, like, there's not even enough time for it to thaw out. No, <laughs> there's not even enough time to thaw the turkey out so that you can cook it on Thursday. Like we were, we had already gone past that point of no return on the turkey. We just couldn't do a turkey. So my wife ran out to go to the grocery store and kind of see what she could figure out. We, maybe we were like, well, maybe we do like ham, or maybe we just get like, you know, maybe just like some like turkey breast or something like that, which kind of sucked because I'm a I'm a dark meat guy. Um, and she texts me. She's like, "They have a, they got duck. You want to try that?" And I was just like, "That sounds like a crazy, crazy idea. Let's just do that." So I spent like most of Wednesday, um, watching YouTube videos on how to cook a duck. So by the time Thursday rolled around, like I was like, "Oh man, I got, I got this." And uh, it turned out really well. Um, yeah, I think the one downside was like I did not anticipate how little meat was going to be on that duck. Mm-hmm. They're, they're not, uh, they're a pretty lean animal as it turns yeah, out. Yeah. Super. This guy was, this guy hadn't ate in a while. Uh, he was very lean. He was, he was kind of skin and bones. It felt like once I went to go like cut everything off of him. Um, luckily, uh, half of my kids didn't like it. So we didn't have to worry about them eating too much of it. Cause we didn't have that much for them to eat. Eat. Fair. Fair enough. Uh, would you do duck again for Thanksgiving? I I don't know about for Thanksgiving, but I would. I want to do a duck again. Like I want a second crack at it to maybe like fine tune a few things, get a duck that you know actually has meat on it. Um, and then like there was a few more like a lot of the recipes lean towards like Asian cuisine because it's duck is is very popular in Asian cuisine. Sure. And I would sure. be more into that where like the rest of my family is not really into that. So I might cook a duck just for me. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I maybe I can I can drop some off at your house. No, no, I was just getting ready to say let me know when this duck feast is happening because I will gladly come down and have some of your Asian we'll, duck we'll feast. Have some duck. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, sounds like uh, an occasion to get back together for the first time in a long time. Yeah. Um, m- m- maybe post vaccines, even. Who knows? There you go. Yeah. Well, I'll make sure um, the duck has the vaccine too. Yes, absolutely. Um, we we actually went out and dined in a restaurant for the first time in forever, and it feels really dirty saying that. Like every time I tell someone, I feel like. Oh man, I I feel like I'm admitting I just like you know yeah. shoplifted or something like that. Uh, but it was like literally one of the first times we've been out to a restaurant um, since uh, the pandemic set in, and uh, we we planned a good offsite, uh, you know, off off hour time. Went at two o'clock. It was really open, and we just we didn't want to have to cook, uh, given it was just my wife and us and our three kids and. It turned out to be a really great opportunity for us to all get out, Um, went to a restaurant that had 
really good social distancing set up um, and had a quiet meal and then went out and we, we grabbed my wife and I were able to grab a beer right by down down by the river uh, outdoors. Uh, tried to squeeze in every last bit of outdoor time that we can right now. Right. Um, As we've so, now plunged into, uh, uh, you know, ice station zebra over here. Yes, uh, yes, we're definitely at that point. Uh, so shout out to uh, Cappy's uh, Wine and Spirits over in Loveland. Uh, they, they don't let kids on their enclosed patio, but they have an outside to the Elements patio that's right by the river. Uh, that was a, a cool spot to grab a drink on Thanksgiving Day. Uh, and they did say they are open uh, 24 hours, a, or not 24 hours a day, but 365 days a year. So if you're looking to grab a drink on Christmas Day uh, here in Cincinnati, that's not a bad shot uh, shout to uh, check out. I, I do this new tradition where I, because, uh, you know, you always do like, even with Thanksgiving, you know, you do the dinner like super early. And we do that with Christmas as well. And uh, I, I've now become one of those guys that then at like 8.30 orders Chinese food. That's your new thing. That's my, that's my thing now. Yeah. Uh, my my sister-in-law's boyfriend is Jewish. And he is like, no, it's like, that's what we do. Like on oh, yeah. Christmas every year, that's like a thing. And so he's like, I almost feel obligated to do it uh, on Thanksgiving as well, just because it feels like that's something you should do on a major holiday at this time of the year. Yeah, so, uh, I, yeah, I have a buddy who's Jewish, and his fa- his family uh, goes and has a big meal at a Chinese restaurant, and then goes to a movie, and just you know goes to a movie theater and sits pretty much wherever they want. Not in 2020, they won't be. Well, no, I don't know what their plan is. Maybe they're renting out a whole theater at this point. It's, it's fairly cheap. Maybe we should do that and just and just play that time that. Uh, uh, Chelsea beat Spurs uh, four to two, and VS Boas had to wear it. Oh man, I'd be all for a uh, wrong side of the pond movie theater rental session where we get in, but I'm not putting that on the screen. I feel like we could find something way better. You know, maybe uh, uh, you know, like uh, on the road to victory, like the old um, you know, English escape from uh, uh, German prison camp. Mike oh, there you Kane. go. Yeah, um, maybe a good old viewing. Is it Stallone in that one? Oh yeah, Stallone plays the uh, he's the American POW in the uh, the Nazi internment camp where no one's getting gassed uh, and they're <laughs> playing football games instead with Pele and Sylvester Stallone as the stand-in goalkeeper. And who, if you want to see some textbook terrible goalkeeping, Sylvester Stallone is uh, definitely the the demonstration of that. Uh, so yeah. yeah. Not part of the long uh, American lineage of, of great goalkeepers. No, no, not exactly. But definitely look for that in your post-pandemic uh, wrong side of the pond public programming. Uh, let's get into the podcast, though, uh, as we've talked too much about the holidays because really it's a truncated holiday season. But we got a full weekend of soccer. In fact, we got soccer on it. Thanksgiving, too, which was awesome. I did, I did like that. Um, I mean, that is a good Thanksgiving tradition. I know Arsenal fans are, I mean, that's like a yearly thing for them. Um, but you got, you got to watch, you know, your, your, your squad play. Yeah. I mean, that was, a was fun, that? that was a fun thing to do. Like, especially since we have family obligations this year that we normally would have, like I got to actually sit down and watch Spurs play, which was a really fun kind of, thing to think about like oh man what if this could be an every year thing uh to an extent which i know it won't be but uh it was it was kind of a a uniqueness that i will appreciate about this thanksgiving was the fact that i was it was almost like boxing day where like there was nothing to do and like all i had to do that day was get up and watch soccer and given that we weren't cooking it was doubly so i'm telling you i think i think mls cup Maybe not on Thanksgiving Day, but like that Friday or even that Wednesday night. Like nobody really's got anything going on that Wednesday night. Like I feel like they 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 need to capitalize on this American holiday. Oh, so that's you're cutting a whole month off the playoff schedule. I just I, f- I feel like that's gonna be a tough ask. Am I though? I think I I mean most seasons you're cutting off like a week or two. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, maybe. And I, especially if they go to this truncated playoff format that we're looking at right now, where we're not playing yeah. two legs, like, and, that, and that's been brilliant. And that's getting ahead a little bit of where we are in the show. Uh, so let's save that for later and, and get into fantasy. That's what everyone wants to talk about, right? Uh, yes. No. No one wants to talk about that, so let's do it quickly. Zach Horwitz, third week on top of the show. Congrats to him. He's probably due some wristbands at this point. Uh, Both of us had shitty weeks. I fell 15 places. You fell one place. I'm in 41st. You're in 77th. There's your fantasy update. Let's get into the Premier League and talk about things that are actually good for the both of us because you sent me this talking point, and it was such a perfect way to encapsulate this, especially after the result we saw at the weekend. Chelsea nil, Tottenham nil, but both of them remain sky high in the Premier League table. Spurs in, in, in first place, which still feels weird to say out loud. Chelsea in third. Um, your, your talking point was, are our clubs real contenders? And oh, I want to say yes. I, I really, I want to say yes. And I feel like we can for you guys, but maybe this is just my yeah. innate. Yeah, I mean, I think I think we both want to be negative about our own club, but I do want you. I I think we each need to sit here and pitch our team as a contender. Okay. Okay. I can do it. So, Tottenham Hotspur. Uh, you it's year two, Jose. This is the year where he wins something. What 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 do you got? What what's what is the thing that has you saying we we're actually in this? You know, it's weird. I'm glad you asked that question because it, I, w- I would have never answered this last year the same way. But I think, I think Jose Mourinho is part of the reason I feel really good about this. And it's not just Jose, right? Like it comes with so much else. And we've talked about this in previous shows. This squad is different than any Spurs squad I've ever experienced in my 20 plus years of following the team. We've never had depth in a way that Tottenham has depth right now. And not only do we have depth and, and, you know, attacking weapons that we can bring off the bench, but we have a manager who has experience and know how on how to do that and navigate those waters. Yeah. Like, and no offense to Pochettino and I love Pochettino still. Like I still deep down want him to come back when Jose's done. I want him, I don't want him to go anywhere else. I want him to come back to us. But I, I truly believe right now that Jose is an X factor because he's so used to navigating these waters. And we got into this in the midweek on Twitter as we were conversing online with our buddy, Jason and Jason was talking about like, you know, what do you miss? Uh, a little bit, he was talking about how I, I, it was like a, just the flow of the conversation got into the bit of um, like the like Mourinho playing mind games, right? And the need for him to play mind games with this Arsenal squad. And it's kind of like, this is what Mourinho does. It, it, he doesn't need to do it because of the opponent that he's playing. It's like, this is what he does. And I feel like we're seeing peak Jose where he's like, pulling the strings with his squad and he's pulling the strings with his uh, media relationships and he's dropping these little bombs in his, his comments publicly. And it's just kind of like, Oh, we're finally the beneficiaries of all this. And I, I just, it's giving me this weird hope and I, we've got to get over this bridge of the North London Derby this weekend if they can get a result here, I, I think I'll truly be a believer that we're an actual contender. And I think Jose's the difference. I No, I, I, I agree. I think having that manager... You know, I, th- I think we talked about this when Jose first took over the Spurs gig, is that despite the fact that a lot of fan- supporters were very skeptical about the move... There was this sense of like, wow, we have one like this is not not some up and coming manager. This is not some guy cutting his teeth so he can go get that big gig. Like we have one of the most established, experienced, uh, successful managers in European football is now what like is now at Spurs. So like if anyone can figure it out, it should be this guy, right? 
Absolutely. And look, like Mourinho has his detractors and I get why he is like people have come at me a little bit and been like, oh, well, you're now just defending him because he's, you know, a Spurs manager and sure. But too, like I've long been a Mourinho fan. I think you can attest to this even when he's had stints at Chelsea. I've I've been an admirer of the way that he approaches things, not necessarily always like, oh, I agree with that tactic, but. He, he brings an entertainment value that no one else brings. And like, I, I can find value and understand what he's doing with his tactics, both on and off the pitch. And I just, I, I feel like it feels like I, I don't want to admit that I like that now. And it's different from what it was before he was my manager. Like I could be like, Oh, I like him from an arm's length. But now I feel like when I admit that I like that as he's my manager, everyone's like on the attack, like, oh, now you like him. It's like, no, <laughs> it's like I was I was in this camp beforehand. It's not it's not to say that everyone should agree and think that his his tact or his approach is right. Sure. And and, and I'm there are thousands and thousands of Spurs supporters that are kind of in the process of eating a lot of crow right now from the oh, years sure. of Mourinho oh. hating that they had done. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, I, I think, d- depending on the hire, I think that probably could have gone that way for a lot of us, right? Like, I, I probably talked some smack about a lot of people that could have potentially landed that job, and it would have been terrible. But, no, I, I think it's just, it's a really unique situation. I think it does make us a better squad. Obviously, his draw has brought in players it probably wouldn't have come otherwise that have drastically impacted things but I think Mourinho's our impact and if it can all keep going this way and I I do think if we can get a good result at the weekend against Arsenal I think I think it's going to leave Spurs in a really good spot as they try to attack the tail end of this season yeah it, it, it is weird though we do find ourselves heading into that winter period uh where just as much as before, if not more so, things are condensed. Teams are playing a lot of games. It's also weird, like, we also find ourselves heading into, like, the Christmas period of the season. And normally we're in the mindset of, like, hey, we're almost, like, half. We're basically, like, halfway through the season. But, like, we're not. We're definitely not at this point. <laughs> when no. the season started uh, as late as it did, we're not almost halfway. Yeah, I'm gl- I'm glad you said that. I you know, I was saying like as we get ready to attack the tail end of the season, we're 10 matches in. <laughs> yeah, like we're we're only yeah. we're only 10 matches in. Basically, just a bit over a fourth of the way through it. Yeah. Uh, so, that's me defending Spurs. G- give me why you think Chelsea are actually a a contender this season. Listen, I think going into the season, the talk was, you know, the it was the muscly dog with the skinny legs, right? It was, we have this, look at all this firepower that Chelsea won in and got. This team's going to score goals. And they have. They actually, I think, still lead the league in goals. It was Spurs and, and Chelsea were right at the top with goals scored so far this season. And so that was ha- that's happening. That's looking good. I mean, we're we're playing really well from a, from a attacking and scoring standpoint. And we still haven't really had our full complement of players. Pulisic just came back this weekend. Havertz, uh, um, you know, we're now learning that, you know, Havertz was out for uh, a, a bit for, for COVID. And we're now actually learning that, like, he actually had some pretty severe symptoms. Um, mm-hmm. He was actually, he was, he was relatively sick uh, during that time. So he's just kind of getting back into the flow of things. But we, we went a good stretch without both of those. Um, and we're we're doing really well from an attacking standpoint, and so that was the thing we were always like, well, yeah, that's going to be good. Like we're they're going to this team's going to score goals, but can they stop the other team from scoring goals? And that was the real question going in. And even when they brought in a guy like Thiago Silva, you're like, okay, this guy's. I mean, the pedigree is off the charts, and this guy is still, I mean, he's fresh off a, you know, a good Champions League run and fresh off of, like, you know, having a good season where you're like, this guy still has it. 
but he's also like 35. So like that, that's going to fall off the table at some point. Um, but we bring in Mendy. Uh, he, he first started for Chelsea on October 20th. Since that date, uh, we have only allowed two goals across all competition. Well, that's not that's not too shabby. <laughs> not too shabby. Yeah, uh, I mean, go you, like a month and a half and only give look at, two goals. Yeah, and you look at this like you were talking about, you know, the 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 muscly dog with its skinny legs, right? And but it, it's it's not that, right? Like, no. and it's the same way for Spurs too. Both of these teams are sitting near the top of the table. Spurs are, are one goal behind both Chelsea and Liverpool uh, in goals four and 21 and 22 apiece. Um, but then in goals again, Spurs and Chelsea are pacing the league. Tottenham have only conceded nine goals in 10 Premier League matches, while Chelsea have conceded, conceded 10. Um, so it's just, it is it is wild. It, it's, it's going a little bit against the narrative for both of these teams. Tottenham have a threadbare backline as well. Like they, they barely have enough people in their backline to make it work. And they're not giving up goals either. It's really just, it's very different. I think than the, the, the results I think we probably would have expected for this season. And, and both of them are doing it on a, a pretty incredible level already. So do we, do we then have to ask ourselves, as we do of a, you know, when Everton was looking good at the beginning of the season or when any of these other teams, uh, you know, a Southampton, how long do they keep it up? Do we have to ask that question of how long this level of play can be kept up by these two? Because, I mean, even you you look at that, you say Spurs, threadbare back line. You know, right now, Chelsea is playing extremely well. And a lot of that has to do with Kurt Zuma just playing lights out right now. Um, Kurt Zuma, who was more known for his like goofy reactions and hilarious gaffes on the field. He was almost a bit of a David Louise like character in some instances. Um, having a really, really strong uh, season so far, taking over, you know, you, you thought about guys like Tamori who had a good season last year, uh, Rudiger, who had had it, it appeared cemented himself as part of that back line. Those two guys are basically on the outs. I mean, th- there's reports coming out this week that those guys are going to be shopped in January. Um, so I don't know what the rest, what their back line is going to look like as far as depth uh, heading into the second half of the season. But you, you're right. Like they're playing well with a threadbare back line. Chelsea's playing well with a back line that's, you know, it's, it's, essentially four new pieces trying to f- work together and figure each other out. Um, how long can they keep it up? I don't know. I mean, it's interesting. You bring up Everton at, as a comparison point and they had that great hot start to the season and their fans were singing to the heavens about it and talking about this resurgence and they've yeah. really crashed back to earth three yeah, straight that- losses for Everton uh, at the weekend uh, included in that uh, this time with Everton, they fell to to upstarts leads. So I, I feel like we're seeing a return to the mean. And I've been saying that a couple of t- weeks in a row now uh, with what what we're seeing out of Everton. With Spurs and Chelsea, though, you look at this. Uh, Chelsea haven't lost in eight matches. Spurs haven't lost in nine. We're talking about a 10 match season right now. That's not a, a a hot start and and maybe it will be maybe it pans out so that's what it, it is in the long run but compared to the everton hot start chelsea and spurs are on a far hotter start on a longer stretch of time now is that double the stretch of time yeah that's that's all it really is and at this stage of the season it's hard to judge but i think we're seeing longevity right and with the investment that both of these teams have made into their teams uh, and I expect both will be active in January as well. Um, yeah. I, I fully expect that this isn't just a consistency thing. Um, uh, and, and more, you know, these teams being hot, I think these are two key teams that are actually really good. And when you look at the rest of the Premier League, and we're going to talk about that here shortly, I think that reinforces that idea because in a sea of like anyone can beat anyone. And that truly is the case this year. 
Chelsea and and Liverpool and and Spurs are really the only teams that have consistently been like, nah, you're not taking points off us. And that is, I think, a sign of who's actually a solid squad this year. The tr- the, the true test, I think, is going to be how long they can actually keep that up. And yeah. in, in the Leicester comparison, I think that's an adequate thing. Can can they go the distance? Um, it's funny you say that. Uh, active in the in January. I don't know what what you guys uh, are looking to possibly do for Spurs, but like. It's interesting, Chelsea. All I'm hearing about is departures come January, right? Like a couple center back options departing, uh, Giroud departing. Um, you know, maybe they finally try to loan out Aspila uh, or uh, um, Aretha Balaga or something like that, uh, to kind of thin out the herd there uh, at the keeper position. I don't know. I don't know if Chelsea is actually going to make any incoming moves outside of like maybe. You know, if they if they get rid of, of both of these center backs, um, maybe bringing in some maybe like a veteran center back depth piece. That's that's probably all I'd really see them doing. Yeah, I mean, I, I I almost exactly the same type of solution that I think Spurs need as well. Um, that there aren't a whole lot of areas in the pitch that you can really be like, oh, they need some strengthening there. Um, maybe an outside back, depending on if someone gets shipped out. But yeah, I mean, it's I. I I think both of these teams will maybe try to look to add a piece to help make them that truly title worthy squad. Like, I think that's the position they find themselves in is like, look, if we go out and we find the piece we're missing, the, like that one piece, maybe we find ourselves hoisting a title uh, or a trophy at the end of the season. And I, I you know, I know you, at Chelsea, you guys have won, you know, all these trophies over the last few years. If Spurs won a Premier League title, I, a couple of years ago, someone asked me, like, if you could pick any team that you support uh, to win a trophy, you know, or, or win a major championship, um, they were floored when I said Tottenham. And, like, I would, I would melt. Like, I don't even know what I would do if we won a title. And this is so cart before the horse. But, like what that would mean to a club like us versus a club like you guys, like that would be something, you know, it'd be great for you guys. And I'm sure you'd be stoked about it, but for Spurs, that would be like momentum shifting in our history, right? Like it would be affirming and everything we've been doing. And um, man, it just, the, the thought of the thought of actually being a contender is what it's like, it's wild. Like I, I still, it still feels weird to even talk about it. Yeah, no, I, I get I get exactly how you feel. Um, yeah, I, I as someone who grew up a Chicago Cubs fan, I knew I knew I, that I, I like was and fantasized about like what I how I would feel when they would actually win it. Um, and I would I would literally just sit and like fantasize about like how I would feel when they finally won the World Series. And the weird thing is when they won the World Series. I, I was so overcome that I don't think I felt anything. Um, it was like so unbelievable that I literally, my body couldn't even process it for like too a good much, day or two. Too much emotional stimulation. Overload, <laughs> overload. I can't take it. Can't take it. Uh, well, let's get off this topic after spending nearly 30 minutes of our show uh, discussing how much we love the idea of our teams winning trophies. Let's get around the rest of the Premier League. And some of these results, as I talked about a couple minutes ago, make this situation a lot easier for us to talk about both of these teams being contenders. Liverpool, with an opportunity against slowly Brighton to come out and, and find themselves at the lead of the table, they trip up. And you blew it. They, they blew it, and Spurs for a second week in a row get to ma- remain on top uh, as they draw Brighton one-one. Um, highlight of this match, as well as their their uh, Champions League match in the midweek, Curtis Jones has been this like young up-and-coming player they've been talking about forever, and he's finally gotten a chance to shine. The last two matches came on as a sub in this one and looked fantastic. He was fantastic in Europe in the midweek, um, but. Liverpool continuing to struggle and uh, not necessarily putting up the results you'd expect, but they're quietly in second place, despite not being like this all-conquering 
Liverpool side that we're used to. Uh, Manchester City roll Burnley. That was kind of like, it was like a, you know, a, a, an exercising of some demons. Like they just were, they needed this. This was like a slump buster for them. This was where we, we've had some rough patches here. We're just going to go and murder lowly Burnley and just yeah, get all our anger out. I literally wrote down uh city crucify Burnley and it, it felt that way. Like, they were taking out their pain and anger from their inconsistent results uh, in recent weeks on uh, poor little Burnley, and they really uh, took took the beating there. Uh, City still find themselves pretty low down the table, though. Even with that result, they find themselves in 11th place, six points off the pace at the top of the table, um, but continuing their climb, and I think in, in not too long order, we'll be talking about them in European places. Um, as you, I think you mentioned it, Everton fall to Leeds. This was a really fun match to watch. Oh, man. For a one for a one nil game, um, it was really good. It, it was, it was a game that if you watch it, you're like, you twenty minutes in, you're like, this thing's gonna be like four to three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and and they're just swinging at each other. Uh, Leeds are they're just a joy to watch because this is how they approach every game. And they can just go toe to toe with anyone and it, it may collapse and they may score, you know, a, a great result. And that's what they got here against Everton. Um, but really enjoyed the, you know, the Ancelotti matchup against uh, another top manager in Bielsa. Uh, that's what's great about the Premier League now. We just have so many damn good managers that you just like anything's in the cards. And the managers well, and- are a big, big part of that. And I, I'm I'm a little uh, a little worried this weekend as Bielsa gets to face his nemesis, Frank mm-hmm. Lampard. Yeah, natural nemesis right there too. <laughs> so we'll um, we'll see how that goes. Uh, Bielsa getting his first uh, his first chance to take a swing at at, at Frank Lampard's Chelsea, which I know he will uh, definitely want to. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, West Brom getting a 1-0 win over Sheffield United. Uh, and then on Sunday, and then and then on Sunday, there were there were three matches. We talked about ours already. The nil-nil draw with Chelsea and Tottenham. Yeah. Uh, a game that um, I, I feel like I've never watched a game that was that hotly contested that I felt at the end of like, yeah, nil-nil draw makes a lot of sense. It felt... It really, there were stretches where both teams were dominant, but it, there's, that was a waste of my time. <laughs> it was a waste of my time. And yeah, people get mad the, about that yeah. from a, a Mourinho perspective. And I understand that, but it was, oh, yeah. a, it was a classic Mourinho match where like Spurs only chances came from the fact that they totally frustrated Chelsea's ability to attack. And I was like, it, you know, it's a match that wasn't entertaining, but you got to appreciate it in some respects. Um, although a goal would have maybe made things a little bit more fun. Yeah. Um, and then uh, Southampton uh, take a 2-0 lead into halftime against Manchester United. Final score, Southampton 2, Manchester United 3. Uh, the Cavani comeback. Um, as Ole once again cheats death. Man, I just I, I got into it a little bit with some people online about this, but I, I I don't know. Maybe Cavani's not ready to go ninety minutes. Maybe he's not ready to make a start. But when you had, like Cavani has had an instant impact, he's come off the bench every single time he is in the eleven, and it's just. I don't understand why Ole can't start him. And that's just, it's so many times that we say something like that with Ole. Like maybe it would make sense to bring Pogba off the bench. What do you mean you're not starting Paul Pogba, you know, captain of a World Cup winning side? It's just, I don't know. I, Ole can, he confounds me. And I, I tweeted this, like, I don't think he deserves what Cavani has done for him at any point. Like it just, it feels unfair that Ole gets this little like bail me out bag that he gets to bring off the bench. 
when he seems to bungle the initial setup to begin with. Yeah, you think of Pogba, Cavani, Bruno Fernandez. The guy's got really good pieces there. Um, you know, it's almost as if he doesn't deserve. He do- doesn't deserve to have this good of players because he clearly there's there's some kind of disconnect with how he he's he's going about using them. And I, I know Cavani's only been there for about a minute, but. I mean, we're in what year two of the Pogba thing? I mean, you'd think someone would be able to coax something out of Paul Pogba, and if you can't, like, what does that say about you as a manager? Like, he's too good to not coax something out of. He's been able to do it with Juventus. He's been able to do it with France. Why can't he do it at Manchester United? Is that Paul Pogba, or is that the club and the people they employ above him? So hmm. I don't know, but they. <laughs> They somehow bail him out this time again, and United score a victory that, you know, feels a little unfair, especially against the Southampton side, who have just continued to impress. And, you know, again, they're doing it on set pieces, but that's that's sometimes what you have to do to get results. But this is also a little bit of that sign that, you know, do Southampton really actually have what it takes to get over the hump this season? Well, for like 70 minutes, they did in that match. Um, We don't know if they have enough uh, to go the distance and to to finish in a European place. We don't know that. What we do know is that Arsenal lost uh, to Wolves. We do know that. Yes, they did. Um, Great result from my perspective. Uh, Also means that Spurs are totally going to lose to 14th place to Arsenal on uh, the North London Derby this weekend, despite an eight-point commanding lead. Um, but, you know, it's wild. You would think, like, Arsenal losing the Wolves would probably be, like, the biggest storyline from this match. But it's really not that at all. In fact, it's a cracked skull from Wolves' Raul Jimenez uh, that is absolutely uh, and appropriately stolen all the headlines about it. And not only are we, you know, mega concerned about Raul, Uh, but like just, it seems there's so many things about this incident that I just, I take such issue with within the Premier League, right? Like David Luiz was allowed to continue after someone was hauled out off the field from a head collision in which part of that dude's skull had to be cut away. So his brain wouldn't expand so much and kill him. Like there, I know that Louise looked like he might have been okay to go on. I don't. You never know with David Louise. David Louise always looks slightly concussed. Yeah, right. But there's no like, Raúl Jiménez didn't move for like five minutes, and yeah. I don't care if he says he's able to go on. Like, why? Why? Why did he continue on to play? Um. It's really, it's just, it's, it's unbelievable that he was allowed to continue on. And, um, that, that's just one half of it. Then, then you go to the other side of it. And this is something we've not talked about on the podcast, but there were some, some recent studies that have come out that seem to confirm that just heading the ball for like 20 minutes in practice makes it so that you, uh, when, when you go to taking a concussion test, you're actually not able to pass the test. And it was like 80% of the the people weren't able to pass it just from 20 minutes of heading. And when you see something like this collision, and this isn't an infrequent thing that happens in this sport, it really, it really makes me start to wonder if we are unnecessarily putting players at risk. And I say this as a player who's had at minimum five concussions. So, ah, I don't know. I I watch just a a guy lay motionless on the field for a long time. And I have to wonder, like, could we be doing something different with this sport to, to not have that type of situation crop up as often? Yeah. I mean, I think it, it it does, you know, there's a reason why in most of youth football, heading the ball is not allowed. Like we, we shield that from uh, young players for a reason. 
Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, it's weird. I, I also, as a, a coach of players who have made that transition over the hump from not being allowed to head uh, to being allowed to head, um, and then also being a player who was allowed to head throughout my youth, um, there is definitely a, a growing prominence, at least anecdotally from what I've experienced, of players not knowing how to play balls in the air and then thus being unprepared to do so. And I, I wonder, and I don't know uh, whether this is true or not, but I wonder, would that maybe potentially cause more injury risk in its own right, where players just aren't trained to go up and for aerial challenges? I don't know. Um, yeah. And that's what that makes is. this whole situation so complicated. Um, and I, I think what it really boils down to, and I think people will hate this, but I think, it, I think maybe the ultimate solution is... <clears throat> Headgear. Head gear. I, th- I think it's the solution. You still and got that prototype that guy sent you? I do, yeah. Uh, a Storelli head guard uh, from, from my good buddy Claudio Storelli and his very successful company, uh, Storelli uh, Protective Gear and, and Goalkeeper Gear. But, um, yeah, it's um, I, I think that might be the direction that we're starting to head with soccer. Yeah, I could definitely see it. I mean, I, I don't... I, I wait. You'd think you'd see it in like the youth ranks first, where they basically just make it mandatory. Yeah, I, th- I think that's a good start for it. But I, I, I think until pro players start adopting it on a, a wide ranging effort, um, I, I don't know that it's going to be successful at all because they drive what's cool and what filters down to the masses. Sure. And um, I think it's going to be a little bit like. If, if it's instituted, they'll almost have to do it like what the NHL did, uh, where players who were around prior to this rules institution are grandfathered out of it. Because uh, dude, that was such a wild year, though, time there in the NHL where you, oh, man, there was that you one dude, who held out for like, dude roll around with no helmet. <laughs> there was that one dude who held out for like five or six years, man. Like he was. Like everyone else is, you're like, look at all these smart people, and then there's this dumbass out there. <laughs> Like literally asking for pucks to hit his brain and explode it, and it's well, just. I mean, I mean that, the, but the rollout we're kind of talking about is is something you see in, you know, youth hockey, at all levels of youth hockey, all the way up to college, you have to wear a full cage mm-hmm. around your, you know, the full cage helmet, and in the NHL it was just a helmet, and now they've made the NHL players. Uh, the visor is now mandatory. Mm-hmm. And so like it, they're kind of in this slow progression to like possibly having something more like that. Oh man. I will never forget one of my, um, you know, I'm a hockey fan as well. And my all time favorite hockey player, Steve Eiserman getting his face smashed by a puck at the end of his career. And, you know, he was already in his forties when that happened, but it was like the dagger in his career at that point. Like, when you get your face smashed by something that's that hard and moves that fast, like what the hell are you doing? Like, of course, as a sport, you should be like, what, like, why aren't we protecting our players more? And it just seems the natural thing to do. And I obviously, I, I want nothing but the best for Raul Jimenez. I, as a, you know, like I saw a few United States fans like kind of celebrating the idea. And it was like, no way like go jump off a cliff like i want no fans who want the other team's best player knocked out over something like this like yeah that's great i'd rather i'd rather earn it against the best players than have some sort of dark fortuitous moment also like i um i don't i don't know if uh, any u.s uh supporter has seen a schedule lately we there is no game with Mexico scheduled at any time now, so I don't, I don't know what they think they're being, being uh, saved from by him being yeah. injured. Yeah. Um, but so Arsenal do lose, and that's really the main takeaway here. Yes, absolutely, I'm, and I'm all for uh, making that the main takeaway in most conversation points. Um, Are they? Like, I was. I mean, I, 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 I have a. Uh, Serious XM, and I was listening to the pundits talk about it this this week, and like, there's already a lot of pundits 
comments out there saying like Arsenal are they're broken again. Like they're just back to every time you think that they've turned the corner, they're just they don't. And that's what a lot of people are saying. Like they're broken again. Like this team is a problem, a mess again. Well, it, especially well, it, when you hear Arteta come out this week and drop the David Moyes line of all David Moyes lines where he's like, well, if you throw enough enough crosses, like the math will work out for you. And it's like, well, I, I don't know if you paid attention to your squad, but literally none of your players are made for freaking heading the ball into the back of the net. And it's just like. I, I like, do you take that job and just have like blinders to get slid onto you where you're completely oblivious to the type of squad and, and players that you're recruiting in? Like, I just, I, I don't understand how they keep finding themselves back in this type of situation. And you do start to wonder if it's incompetence at a higher level uh, than, than what we're actually seeing regular blame attributed to. Um, and I know people like to shout about, you know, oh, you know, they're the silent ownership uh, and the Americans that are ruining everything. But I don't, I think it's more than just that. And, you know, maybe if they had ownership that was more involved, they, they wouldn't be here, but this, this starts to feel a little bit like a, almost like it is at United where like th- these clubs have lost their mojo and yeah. Yeah. You wonder if they can get it back. I just, I don't know that they have enough weapons in their arsenal to actually be uh, a long-term contender for at least European places. Don't you go down my man, Ross Barkley. Nah. Uh, all right, let's go stateside. Uh, MLS playoffs are going on. I, you know, I was going to interject earlier when we kind 
now we're sort of talking about the playoffs uh, at MLS, but you, you mentioned how it's a truncated format. I don't know if I like this format where, like, everything's kind of weird and staggered to where, like, half the bracket is further down the road than the other half of the bracket. And, like, your game next is a quarterfinal. Your game next is a semifinal. I don't know. I just I feel like there's a little wonkiness to how they've kind of mapped this thing out. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely some weirdness to it. I I just kind of chalk that up to 2020. I mean, yeah, no, else, definitely. What what else are you gonna do? But I I think if nothing else, I just normally I like two legs. That seems a lot more fair. But I just I like the thrill of this, and it's kind of made it. I mean, it, it, I I hate the comparison, but it's made it a little NCAA tournament ish, right? Well, like. Yeah. Anyone. Well, I mean, and, and we're seeing that in the results. Yeah. And sp- speaking of that, we now are at our final four. We know who our final four are um, as we just finished watching uh, Minnesota fly, uh, especially in the <laughs> opening 30 minutes there, fly past uh, Sporting Kansas City 3 0. Um, so we have out west, it'll be either Seattle or Minnesota, or uh, verse in the East, it'll be either the crew or the revolution. Man, MLS is secretly like, can we just, like they literally could, they, they'd be like, can we just have Seattle play themselves in the final? Because you look at those other three candidates as far as markets go and interest from larger markets and you go, oh, Boston, they want they want New England in there. Except for the Revs are like irrelevant in Boston, like completely yeah. off the radar. Now, reports are they've actually entered the fray this week. A, a pretty prominent Boston uh, sports writer who doesn't normally pay attention to soccer compared Bruce Arena to like American soccer's Bill Belichick. And I, I, can, I would say that's fairly accurate. He, I, I wouldn't argue against it. I, I think that's that's a good shout. Especially and, in his uh, uh, post-match demeanor. Yeah, and it, what it did is it sparked a large conversation both internally in Boston as well as nationally. And I don't, I just don't know if it's enough to drag them into MLS's spotlight category. But like literally, none of these markets outside of Seattle are like appealing from a national level. And um, the sad part about that is this, these playoffs have been awesome. And every story for all of these teams, if they win the whole thing is incredible. And it's just, these playoffs have been like, I I just, even without fans for the most part, these have been the best playoffs I can remember in MLS history. Yeah. I mean, we talked about it last week, just all the crazy early matches and all the ones that went to extras. We, we obviously uh, broke down all the insanity that was the Orlando NYCFC situation. Um, but, you know, yeah, right. We have, you know, Orlando makes this run, uh, you know, a deep run into the playoffs. Nashville makes a deep run into the playoffs. You have Minnesota in the, you know, one 90 minutes away from MLS Cup. Um, yeah, I mean, there's just the crew are back. Uh Bruce Arena is just going to kind of just slow play this as, as usual and just grab himself a, a, another a piece of hardware. I mean, the storylines are pretty fantastic. Yeah, I mean, think about the crew potentially lifting a title after getting saved and then going into this brand new home next season outside of downtown Columbus. It's just that that would be incredible. Caleb Porter's rise back to prominence within the league. That would be incredible. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned Minnesota, the, if, if they were to win a title, that would be super hopeful to a club like FC Cincinnati, who yeah. uh, has had a prolonged crap Minnesota start. Um, <laughs> you know, those are the things you could really hope for. Um, and, and then, you know, you look at, uh, you know, Seattle getting to repeat like that, that in itself, uh, dynastic talk that we're talking about with Seattle, you know. Uh, four four finals in, in what, uh, f- five seasons, uh, or three, sh- excuse me, three t- finals in four seasons uh, and three potential titles. That would be an incredible haul. So I just, I, I, I love that the MLS playoffs have continued to deliver from start to finish. And 
Uh, I've, I've just got this feeling they're going to continue. Um, right, right now. So it'll be Sunday will be the Eastern Conference final. Monday, the Western Conference final. Uh, your predictions. I'm going to go uh, homerish pick here with the crew into the final. Um, I'm going to defy my earlier pick for my dark horse uh, in, in Bruce Arena's revs. Although, look, I'm I'm totally living by that idea that like they are still the dark horse uh, in that field. And I think if if anyone's going to be pulling the upset this upcoming weekend and uh, Monday, uh, I, I think it's going to be the Revs. But no, I'm I'm going to back the crew. Uh, and then just for for you know the sake of rivalry, I want Seattle in the final because crew fans hate Seattle, and it will just be a a, a little. Hate fest online as we head into uh, a, a a good finale for a weird season. What that that stems back all the way to what uh, Dosa Zero 2013. It does, yeah, and the, uh, the the capo incident and wanting to put a capo stand at, at the front of the Nordeca, uh, which is just not something they do in Columbus. And um, Ao literally <laughs> brought in Seattle people to make it all happen. It was wild. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to go, I'm going to go the opposite. I'm going to go, give me Minnesota, the Cinderella story. Um, the little, the little engine that could Kevin Molino, uh, (laughs) resurrection that we've already been seeing in these playoffs. Uh, give me that and give me Bruce arena, uh, taking the, uh, MLS's Buffalo bills to, uh, to another MLS Cup where they actually would probably be the favorite, oh, and I man. think would win. The Buffalo Bills comparison is not only great because of how many times they've been the bridesmaid, but also because of like the New England <laughs> kind of relationship there. It's just like the parallels are just a little too juicy. So I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be a fun weekend. Uh, hopefully, everyone else is as well. I think that brings us to winners and wankers this week. Uh, winners and wankers real quickly. Uh, Greg Vanny steps down at, at in Toronto. Where does he uh, land? Um, I said LA, um, it, it, Atlanta just doesn't feel exotic enough for Atlanta. Like I, f- I feel like they, they need to yeah. get him in. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think, I think he probably gets named, uh, to that LA gig probably here in like the next like week or so. Yeah. Um, but then who do well, I mean what does Atlanta do? But it's overpay for someone they shouldn't is probably the answer. Here's one here's one for you. Patrick Vieira just got let go. Ooh. Bring him back. Alan Party is still looking for a job, I think. I think he he probably is. Probably gotta keep looking. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think that's that phone's ringing, but all right. All right, fair uh, enough. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't I don't know what they would do. I you're you're right though. They they're gonna go with something. It's gonna be an international hire. They'll like that's just uh, what they do. Convince they Andre Villach Boas to leave Marseille. Yeah, I like that one. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> winners and wankers. Uh, win- winners and wankers. Um, let's go. We go wankers first now. Yeah, that's right. Give me your wanker. Cause my, my wanker and winner are tied together and I have to, t- I have to say the winner first in order to get to the wanker. Oh crap. I kind of was in the same boat. <laughs> ah, dang it. Um, all right, let's go old format. Let's give me okay. your winner. Uh, my winner is, uh, Leo Messi for removing his shirt after scoring Barcelona's fourth in their weekend win against Osasuna. Uh, and revealing in uh, a Maradona Newell's old boy shirt, the same club uh, who Messi grew up playing for uh, and who Maradona played for when he was a kid uh, to celebrate uh, the passing. Uh, amazing. We've made it an hour into the show and haven't ma- made mention of it yet. But uh, Diego Maradona passing away at the age of 60 this week, truly a legend of the game. And it can't be understated like that. And that that is underselling it like. He's like Messi is Messi, right? Um, but before there was Messi, Maradona was like 
like the revolution. And I, 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 I never thought we'd see a player like him again. I got to, I got to watch him at the tail end of his career and was, was lucky enough to do so on, on television at least. Um, and he was a shadow of his former self, but man, the, the guy really changed the way the sport was played. And, um, yeah, it's um, it, it's sad to see him go, but I thought Messi's touching contribution as the torchbearer for Argentinian legendhood is uh, was really cool. Uh, your wanker. Yeah, uh, my wanker is Barcelona getting fined three thousand euros by FIFA and UEFA for uh, Messi removing his shirt for that goal. Standard <laughs> fine for such a thing, but just god damn it. Like you know, you don't just try to wave it that one time. Yeah, I mean, in, of, of in, all in things. a gesture of 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 honor and homage yourself as fifa uh to maradano you don't just do it. all right whatever not much beauty not left much. in this beautiful game no guess not yeah what about your winner and wanker this week uh my winner is uh vanderbilt women's goalkeeper sarah fuller uh because of just people going down with uh, a positive test and and, and uh you know, uh, having to quarantine because of exposure. Uh, the Vanderbilt football team found themselves without anybody that uh, could specialize in kickoffs or any kind of, uh, you know, ball on a tee situation. So in stepped uh, SEC champion women's goalkeeper, Sarah Fuller. Uh, now, unfortunately, she only got to do a kickoff. That was the only contribution she had to the game because Vanderbilt is so bad offensively. Yeah. They could they couldn't get the ball past midfield. So she never even got a chance at like a field goal or even got to like, you know, uh do another kickoff because they had scored, like she, none of it. She didn't get to do anything else because the team was so bad. But first uh a female to play uh for a Power 5 football team um Maybe she'll get another chance next year. I mean, ho hopefully we're not having uh, situations where people are, are testing positive uh, next fall. But um, uh, just a cool a cool moment. Uh, and unfortunately, what always goes with this, uh, the wanker, would be uh, all of the uh, just testosterone riddled men who just couldn't handle that this happened. Oh man, it might be a lack of testosterone that's that's fueling uh, the the hatred of a lot of this from some of the men. I just I can't. The, the even... amount of dudes that brains broke over just this very basic thing that ha happened, it is just uh, astonishing. It, it it draws me back to that Fox Sports commercial uh, that we had, I think it was at the, at the beginning of the year where it was all the women sports broadcasters and their secret society where they talked about their number one goal as it is every week is to ruin sports for men. And yeah. like, it's, it's exactly that. And I, I don't know. And maybe I, I don't think it would have been any different before I had daughters, but I like that whole saying, like where guys need to have daughters to like really truly wrap their heads around this sometimes never becomes more clear in moments like that, where you see a bunch of like idiots say some things that like if they eventually have a daughter that they'd be like, oh, my God, if my daughter heard me say that, like I would cower into a shell like I can't even imagine telling my kid like the guys who are being like, I hope she gets pummeled. Or like, I hope, uh, you know, I hope she has an opportunity to really see what football is like. Like, I think she knows what football is like. Like, no yeah. one's not seen a football game. Like, you don't go out there and be like, oh, I'm shocked that there's a chance I might get hit. Like, what a ridiculous oh my concept. goodness, this man might try to hit. Like, what? No. Wait, like, wait, wait. They can where? hit me out here? That's why you put me in these pads? Nah, it was just, it was ridiculous. But no, it was uh, a super cool moment. And, um... Even cooler, there was a soccer connection for it as well. And I hope to hell she gets an opportunity to kick next year. Uh, hopefully. Uh, yeah, again, the Vanderbilt, not very good. The, this game also, uh, this the, the loss also meant that the, that the head coach got fired like the next day. So yeah, who, who knows what that regime will be next year to possibly uh, offer her that, that second chance. For sure. 
Uh, well, that brings us to the end of this week's show. We ended on wankers, both of us. We, we promise not to end on low notes like this as much as we can, but here we are yet again. Negative Nancy. Yay! Yeah. Uh, as always, if you want to get involved in the show, Jeremy's at Jeremy Lance. I'm at Wrong Cut Upon on Twitter. There's a forum on the website if you feel like going that route. But otherwise, uh, we will talk to you guys next week. Bye, folks. Bye.